my name is David Cobb. I am a lawyer by training, as Diane said, but I really consider myself an engaged citizen. And by that I mean, yes, I have sued corporate polluters, I've lobbied elected officials, I did run for office myself, I've participated in educational forums and demonstrations and protests. In fact, I was in it here in this area in Seattle in November of 1999 where 50,000 of my good friends gathered. I see by the looks on some faces, some people were here there as well, right? Uh, the point is that I have committed myself to using every tool available in a nonviolent, peaceful means to affect the systemic transformational change that I believe we desperately need and so richly deserve. And I don't believe that any of you here who have chosen to come to this presentation need me to convince you that things are bad. I don't think I need to convince anybody tuning into free speech TV that things are bad. People who voluntarily choose to come to an International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers sponsored event or voluntarily choose to watch free speech TV already know things are bad. I don't think that's my job. I think my job is to convince you to invest your time and energy in WAMEND, to invest your time and energy in MOVE to MN nationally. I have to convince you, inspire you that it's worth investing your time and that we have a plan to win. And so, in order to do that, I want to share with you something that I learned intuitively as a successful trial lawyer, and now science is proving, and that's this. If you want to be convic convincing, facts don't necessarily matter. <laughs> I mean, the first time I heard it said that way, I thought, this is terrible. I mean, like many of you, I've invested a lot of time and energy in facts. And we had this idea that if you could just present facts logically and cogently, why everybody will see what we see and that somehow change would happen. Then I came across the work of a fellow named George Lakoff. Oh, I see some of you know this name. George Lakoff, a cognitive scientist by studying human behavior, cognition, how human beings process information, how we see the world, he observes something that now that I hear it makes total sense, and that's this. Human beings don't make sense of the world through collecting facts and data, running our brain like some supercomputer algorithm and, and spitting out responses. What he said, what I actually know is, human beings understand the world through the stories we tell each other. And the stories that are told over and over again become the narrative or the frame, the cultural setting for how the world operates. So what Lakoff says is, if you want to actually persuade somebody, you have to tell them a narrative and a story that makes sense to them how they already see the world works. So, because I do want to be persuasive and convincing, and I know that you as human beings understand the world through stories, y'all, I'm thinking to tell a story. I'm just going to tell the story on how it came to be that large transnational corporations are not merely exercising power today, I'm going to tell the story on how it came to be that corporations are ruling us. As surely as masters once ruled slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling in this country because they're making the decisions. Corporate CEOs already decided how much poison's in the air we're all breathing right now. Corporate CEOs decide how much toxins get to be in the public water supply. Corporate CEOs get to decide whether you get health care or not. Corporate CEOs decided to take this country into war. And we the people, we get to choose between Coke or Pepsi. We get to choose between paper or plastic at a grocery store checkout line. See, we're given consumer choices, oh, provided you have the money to pay. Let's just take a moment to ask, what happened in this country where human need is actually not what drives public policy, but instead only money? But I want to stop for a minute further and say, even if you have all of the money, that you need to make the consumer choices that you want to make, even if you're in that privileged position, do not mistake that consumer purchasing choice with political power. Because political power would be the opportunity to participate in a meaningful way with how our society is organized. And saying it that way, I hope it's clear, we rarely get a chance to actually talk about how does the criminal justice system operate.
How does our healthcare system operate? How does our energy production and distribution system operate? We almost never get an opportunity to participate in a meaningful way with that. So I am going to tell a story. And as I tell this story, I want to be very clear. I'm going to cover four topics together. The first topic I want to make sure that we cover together is the word democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot. So to make sure we've got some common ground, I want to ask, does anybody know from what language the word democracy derives? Greek, very good, it's Greek. De demos means the people. Kratia, K-R-A-T-I-A, means rule or power. So literally, the word democracy means the people rule. Pop quiz, y'all. How many of you believe we the people are ruling in the United States? Don't be shy. Look around. Nobody raised their hands. I ask that question everywhere I go. Nobody ever raises their hands. That's a problem. But saying it another way, I think it's a good thing. What? Oh, no. It's not a good thing that we the people don't rule in this country. I think it's a good thing that people aren't raising their hands to that question. I think it's a good thing that we're living in a moment in time where we are being courageous enough to confront a very difficult, jarring reality that notwithstanding the creation myth of this country, notwithstanding what we want in this country, notwithstanding what we deserve in this country, we the people don't rule. In fact, a small, unelected, unaccountable group of corporate CEOs rule us. If we were going to stay in the Greek language, we would say we don't have a democracy, we have an oligarchy, right? The rule by an elite. In fact, it's so bad now, I think we need to make up a new word. Let's call it a kleptocracy, right? The rule by a thieving wealthy elite, right? Because they are stealing from us. They are stealing our labor, but they're also stealing the commons in the natural world. They're stealing our future, and they're stealing our imagination space. Our ability to imagine a peaceful and just and democratic world is literally being stolen away from us. And that's going to continue unless and until we the people take it back. That brings me to the next topic, which is the word sovereignty. Y'all, if I just had the word the sovereign on the board, who or what would you think of? Quick, the sovereign. A nation. Sovereign, the king, right? The concept of sovereignty means the authority to rule. And I really appreciate the fact that you thought of the nation because these days when it comes to sovereignty, the national sovereignty that's being threatened by the Trans-Pacific Partnership ought to be on everybody's mind. But the word sovereignty means the authority to rule. That's because 500 years ago, the sovereign was the king. The king was the sovereign. The words were literally synonymous. And where did the king claim his authority to rule? God. You don't get more legitimate. Right? I mean, if you have the authority to rule because God or the divine told you to, that's pretty powerful. In fact, to illustrate what I mean by this, we'll do a little exercise together. This exercise is always a lot of fun <laughs> for me. You'll see, I will invite everybody here in this International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Hall to play along with me. Close your eyes and repeat after me. David Cobb is my king. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing. What you all did, though, you all snickered at me. And you're, most of you are still like, it's not a, a friendly smile, but you're mostly smirking at me right now, right? Because you saw what I was asking you to do. You, like, and that's what everybody does. You know why? Because it's funny, right? And not funny as in, Oh, what a witty and droll comment David has made. No, nah, it wasn't that sophisticated. In fact, a, a comedian who studies how to make people laugh, she or he would say, Cobb, that's a cheap joke. It's called absurd humor. You set them up. You made people say something that they and you and everybody knows is just absurd, so it creates a juxtaposition. That's a cheap laugh, a comedian would say. I mean, the idea that I could tell you how to live your life because who my daddy is... Or even better, I get to tell all y'all what to do because of the divine right of kings. Of course you laugh at that. Of course you smirk at that. That's ridiculous. That is absurd. Except for 500 years ago, people just like you and me not only said it, but we believed it. I want to take a moment to really settle on something here. If George Lakoff is correct, and he is, about human beings understanding the world through stories and narratives, Imagine only 500 years ago the entire cultural narrative was an absolute understanding that the divine right of kings was absolutely the way it was, the way it should be, the way it always would be. 
Now, look, I myself am a Green Party member. Uh, you know, I, I, I work with the Green Party, uh, and, and I'm proud of that. And I'm equally proud to say I have a long history of working with Democrats uh, on issues where there is common ground, and there is a lot of common ground uh, on issues where I work with Democrats. And I'll go you one better. I have a history of working with Republicans and conservatives and libertarians on issues where there's common ground. And honestly, the fight against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the fight against NAFTA that I was involved in, or the World Trade Organization, or for that matter, uh, the, the Patriot Act, there's been a lot of ways that I've been able to work in coalition and in partnership with principal conservatives. Uh, I've worked with socialists and, and anarchists. See, I say that not so you'll pat me on the head for what a good boy I am. I say it so you'll appreciate that I have a history of working in coalition with people and that in my 30 years of social change work looking for coalition people to collaborate with, I've never had the privilege or the opportunity to work in coalition with a monarchist. Right? They don't exist anymore. Right? You can't find one that would actually make that argument. But 500 years ago, that's all there were. And 500 years is the blink of an eye in human history. So when people tell me, oh, you can't make changes, you can't amend the Constitution, that's too hard. We'll never do that. I think, have you not been paying attention? Because throughout all of world history, and most especially through U.S. history, profound changes have been made. And I don't mean just changes in one party or another, one president or another. I mean systemic transformation has occurred. You know, like the enslavement of one group of human beings or not. You know, like women are nothing more than chattel property or not. Or did you know that it was once an actual felony to organize on behalf of fellow workers because it was considered a criminal conspiracy? Right? Those kinds of changes are able to be made. And here it comes, y'all. The Texan going to get metaphysical. You ready? Here it comes. We are all individually participating in creating our shared cultural reality. Another way to say that is, if enough people think that something is true, and enough people act like it's true, it is true. So if it is true that the United States of America is fundamentally racist, sexist, and class oppressive, and that is true. And if it is true that these huge transnational corporations are destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself, and that is true. See, if these things are true, we better start thinking and acting differently. We better start thinking and acting like we're in a crisis. The global crisis is not coming. The global climate crisis is here. And it's going to get worse unless and until we interrupt it and change how we are conducting economics on this planet. And we are in an economic crisis. It's not over. In fact, if you think that debt cri the, the mortgage crisis was bad, wait till the student debt crisis actually really hits. I'm young slash old enough to remember a time where you could get out of college and within just a couple of years get a decent paying working class job and buy a house. Those days are gone. You can't do that anymore. The children today, or I say children, the young people today are coming out of college with a debt burden of fifty, seventy-five, a hundred thousand dollars or more. That used to buy a really good house, y'all. Those days are gone. So the economic crisis is not coming. It's here and getting worse. And here's the thought: What if capitalism can't actually solve this crisis? Here's the thought. What if capitalism actually is this economic crisis? Just putting that out there. But I'm going to go one further. We've also got an ethical and moral crisis, a social justice crisis. What else can we call it whenever we know that the criminal justice system is really creating a school-to-prison pipeline to commodify young black and brown children, to treat them as if they are a commodity, to be locked up in prison so that somebody can actually make money off of them? What else can it be but a social justice crisis when there actually has to be a movement called Black Lives Matter because apparently in our society, it doesn't seem to be true. 
And I think that we ought to say that out loud. We are in a series of crises that are actually coming together. And I don't say that so that you can actually get freaked out like, oh, no, it's so bad. I say it because I want to have some clarity around it. And I also want to remind you that in the Chinese language, where they use symbols for individual words or concept, the symbol or word for crisis is also the symbol for another concept. Ladder. Opportunity. Opportunity. Friends, I submit to you, we are in a crisis. And that crisis presents a kind of opportunity that we've never had before. And that opportunity is the ability to actually restructure society so that it is peaceful, just, democratic, ecologically sustainable, and racially fair. That is actually within our power if we would only have the courage to believe that we have the power to do it. Again, at the end of the day, I think that the most important thing that we can do is tell a narrative that we believe that it's actually possible not just to win some incremental changes, that, that we can actually be part of transformational cultural change. And that brings me to the next topic, which is legal personhood. First, please note I did not write corporate personhood on the board. Right? I wrote legal personhood because this concept of legal personhood means the ability to assert rights. And since we're talking about legal personhood, we mean the ability to assert rights under law. And saying it this way, I hope it's clear that this is not a technicality that only lawyers should concern themselves with. The ability to assert rights under the legal system and have it acknowledged by law and culture has been at the core of every mass movement in this country. Actually, from the beginning of this country, the American Revolution was at its core a question on who had the ability to assert rights of how the society operated. The abolitionist movement, the women's suffrage movement, the trade union movement, the civil rights movement, the LGBTQ movement, all of these are about the ability to assert your rights. At the end of the day, it's not merely about a policy position, it's about the structure. That's really important. And the last word on the board, at least for now, is the word corporation. Now, does anybody know from what language the word corporation derives? This one's Latin. Corpus means body. And the suffix T-I-O-N means to have or create. So literally, when you translate corporation, you mean to have or create body. And by body, I mean physical body, right? And that's because in law school we're taught, and by the way, are there any other lawyers in the crowd who would admit it? No? All right, I'll just tell you, in law school we're taught that a corporation is a legal fiction. In fact, even though you didn't go to law school, how many of you have heard that, that a corporation is legal fiction? All these hands go up, right? So friends, if a corporation is a legal fiction, that begs this follow-up question. What does the word fiction mean? Not true. Made up, right? In law school, my corporations professor stood before us and she said clearly and unambiguously, you have to understand that a corporation doesn't actually exist in the material physical world. And as a student, I thought, isn't that called reality? But then she went on to explain, however, it is a construct. So we pretend like this group of people, investors and shareholders, but also the employees and the material that they gather uh, and the contractual obligations that they make and the cultural assumptions, a very deep and rich concept. We're going to pretend like it's just one thing so we can treat it a certain way under law. And remember, if enough people think that something is true and enough people act like it's true, it's true. Poof. A corporation is a construct because it doesn't actually exist. However, it does absolutely exist because we, the people, have agreed that it exists, right? It is a concept. It is a construct. And the word corporation does come from Latin because the first corporations that we could think of as corporations were created during the Roman Republic. Not, by the way, during the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we'd spend a little more time asking, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that's an important conversation in the United States today. Ah, another little thing to throw out there. But here's the thing. The Romans created the concept of a corporation in order to do things. For example, anybody here either heard the phrase or better yet ever, ever said this, all roads lead to Rome. Yeah, hey, it's 2,000 years later, we still say that phrase, right? Well, check it out. The first universities, corporation. 
the aqueduct system, that amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula without electricity, by the way. Can I just stop for a minute and say one of the reasons I genuinely, sincerely have so much optimism and hope about what is possible is because I know how clever human beings are. Honestly, I don't think you can name a problem today that I can't actually come up with a solution for you. And actually, I'm going to be honest. It's not like I have the solution. It's actually, if you name a problem and you give me about 15 minutes and access to the internet, <laughs> I, can, I can find the solution. Which is to say, in 15 minutes, I can find somebody smarter than me that's figured out the solution. Actually, I'm going to correct myself. In 15 minutes, I can find a group of people who collaboratively, collectively, together, in partnership, have actually figured out the answer. Because here's something that science is proving to us. We're better together. As human beings, we have always actually been better together. We are, in our DNA, collaborators and cooperators. It's the only reason we even exist as a species. We would not have actually made it. In fact, you know what's really interesting when you look at neuroscience? Here's something else. Not only are we designed to cooperate and collaborate, but for 99% of us, if you collaborate with somebody, if you help them, you get a little dopamine shot of pleasure. And get this, if you let other people help you, 99% of us get another little dopamine shot of pleasure. If we're willing to actually be, you know, open and honest enough and admit that we need each other. When we receive help, we're pleasured. When we give help, we're pleasured for 99% of us. There's a problem with 1%, y'all. And isn't it interesting that one parallel is that 1% is actually can be called sociopaths. It's not that they're sadists. It's not that they enjoy causing pain and misery. For some reason, it does seem that about 1% of the homo sapien population, this is across cultures, that about 1% of human beings, for some reason, don't seem to empathize the way that most of us do. So it's not that they enjoy causing pain or suffering, it's that they don't care. And they just look at other people as things to exploit. The problem is that that 1% are now running the damn country. The 1% are running the world. And frankly, folks, that's kind of our problem. I'm going to go one better. It's actually our fault because we've actually let that happen. So I enter into this space with a joyous attitude about the work that is ahead of us, but it's very clear we've just got to figure out how to get past race, gender, class, sexual orientation uh, differences and recognize that actually 99% of us are basically trying to create a better world for everybody, and we've got the 1% that have put us at odds with one another. Now, it's easier said than done, but that's actually what our problem is. But remember I started that whole conversation around the aqueduct system? Well, check it out. That amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula, it was operated, created as a corporation. Likewise, the first hospitals, can you guess? Corporation. So a pop quiz, y'all. What does a road system, a water system, a university, a hospital, what do they all have in common? Who or what do they serve? Answer, the people, the public. Everything I just described is a public process, a public project, public good. The very concept of the idea of the corporation is to create a legal mechanism by which private people come together and do public good or public things. Saying it that way, I hope it's clear that David Cobb is not anti-corporation. Move to amend nationally is not anti-corporation. Wamend is not anti-corporation. In fact, having a conversation about anti or pro uh, corporation is about as ridiculous as having a con an, an argument over tools or hammers, because a corporation is just a tool. It's like Diane saying, well, David, I'm pro-hammer. And I say, oh, no, I'm anti-hammer, because you do bad things with hammers, and, and then we get in that fight. To illustrate what I mean by this, I just want to, uh, uh, we'll use Diane as an actual example. So let's imagine for a moment that sadly Diane is a houseless person. She doesn't have a place to live. But luckily, standing before us, her is a skilled craftsperson. I have a hammer in hand, and I'm building a house, and she's going to live in that house. And I'm good at this, Diane, so this house is going to keep the snow off of you in the winter. It's going to keep the rains off of you in the spring. So right now, is this a good hammer, right? Everybody like, you, we're worth that hammer. Good hammer, right? All right, now, Diane, I want to imagine that standing before you, I do have a hammer in my hand, but now my intention is to bash your skull in. Is that a good hammer? It's a trick question. 
The hammer is just a tool. It's just a thing. The hammer is neither inherently good or bad. The question is, are we putting the tool to its appropriate use? Are we putting the tool to its uh, productive, positive use? I submit to you that the concept of a corporation is a powerful tool. And it is one of the most powerful tools as a construct that human beings have ever created. It can do amazing things. It can also do profoundly destructive things and exploitive things and oppressive things. The problem is not the concept of the corporation today. The problem is a social, political, and economic system that is allowing this powerful tool to exploit and oppress and suck up labor and value and money and accumulated and 1% while the rest of us get shit on. That's actually what's going on in this country and most of us know it but we're not willing to say it out loud because that's what the narrative is. Remember that conversation around narratives from earlier my friends? I submit to you we got to interrupt this narrative. We got to actually tell the truth to one another about what's actually going on. So those are the basic concepts that we want to cover. And I actually remember I was just telling a story, right? So to make this a particularly American story, I want to ask, anybody know how many colonies are founding in the United States of America? This is an easy one. You know this. How many colonies? Thirteen, right? So here's the harder question. Of those thirteen colonies, how many of them were corporations? Nicely done, Diane, all of them. It's a trick question because the concept of corporation is a construct to give body to every single one of them were created or given body by the king. The king created Massachusetts and every other one of them. Now, somebody might be saying, that's ridiculous. The king didn't just poof create the land mass called Massachusetts, but that's why it's a trick question. The land was already there, and the people who lived on the land, by the way, were already there. And so were the deer and the forests and the rivers. You know, reality, nature, it was already there. But it took the king to create Massachusetts. And the king created Massachusetts by the use of a very particular legal instrument or legal tool as well. Does anybody know what cr the king used to create Massachusetts? The answer, a charter. To illustrate how it is that the king created Massachusetts by the use of that legal charter, we'll do another little exercise. In this exercise, I'll be the king again. Hey, why do I get to be the king again? Why am I always the king in these stories? Answer, because I'm telling the story. See how important stories are? See how important it is that we should ask, who the hell is telling these stories? Because here's something that's worth pointing out, that in today's society, Six mega transnational corporations are telling over 80% of all of the stories we hear. And not just news stories, but movies and books and poetry and music. Like all of the narrative content is actually being consolidated into fewer and fewer stories. They're not liberal, but they're not conservative either. They're corporate. Their whole point of these are to commodify everything. It's a very important thing to be thinking about. So, back to my little story. I'm the king. I'm going to create Massachusetts by a charter, which is a, just a piece of paper. And I say, I, the king, create Massachusetts. But I'm not going to bother with the day-to-day -day affairs of Massachusetts. So instead, I will create a royal governor. And I will assign the royal governor with the legal responsibility and task and here comes a quote from the actual charter that created Massachusetts. The royal governor has the legal responsibility to plant, to rule, and to govern this entire operation to benefit me, the king, but also to benefit the other shareholders of the joint stock company known as the Massachusetts Bay Trading Company. You see, Massachusetts began as a for-profit corporation on the same imperial business model as the East India Company did or of any of the others. The very concept of introducing that kind of chartered corporation on this soil was actually nothing more than a colonial conceit to actually justify scooping up the wealth and the resources from the, quote, new land the newly discovered people, by the way, they weren't lost. Nobody was discovered, right? What happened was the European imperial model specifically was designed to steal resources, right? We need to tell the truth. So this whole concept, today we would not call 
the, 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 the person in charge of the joint stock company or royal governor, we would actually call that person what? Say it louder. The chief executive officer of a multinational corporation. I want to submit to you, if we understand the narrative properly, the American Revolution was not merely a rejection of colonial rule and of the idea of rejecting the divine right of kings. The American Revolution was also a people's uprising against the illegitimate role and rule of corporations. The American Revolution was actually an effort to actually break free of that idea. So, after the American Revolution, and one of the things I like to remind us, in the American Revolution, the revolutionaries won. So maybe the idea of, you know, Bernie Sanders is talking about a political revolution. Maybe it's not a bad idea. That's all I'm saying. That like, like when, when you actually want to think about challenging illegitimate rule, revolutions, especially peaceful, nonviolent ones, actually there's a place for them. And in the American Revolution, the revolutionaries did win, and when they won the revolution, they wrote a new charter, a new document to describe how the United States was supposed to operate. What is that charter? What is the supreme law of the land? What is the document that's supposed to be how our principle of government operates? The U.S. Constitution. How many of y'all have read the Constitution? Be honest. Okay, good. A lot of hands go up. So y'all can grade my papers. Make sure I get this right. Because I say when you read the Constitution in its entirety, you'll see two big concepts. The first concept is the most important. In fact, it's so important, it's the first three words. We the people. Those are hallowed words in this country, and they should be. Because we the people come together to create the second concept, which is government itself. Saying it this way, we the people create government. Government is dependent upon we the people. I like how some of my friends like to say it. They say, the people should never be afraid of the government. Actually, they say government should be afraid of the people. If government isn't afraid of the we the people, why are they spying on us? Think about it. I'm going to go one better. Not only is government afraid of we the people, the ruling elite, the 1%, or the real ruling elite, which is really the 0.001%, the true billionaire class, they are so terrified of we the people. And if you don't think that's true, i got one word for you. Occupy. Right? Because during the height of the Occupy encampment, I had the privilege of traveling around the country. And I went to Occupy encampments, probably 60 of them. And you know, giving this basic workshop. And you know what I saw? I saw people talking to each other. That's what I saw. And that terrified the ruling elite. Because why? Because, see, the ruling elite want us to talk to each other as long as we talk about sports or celebrity or gossip or, most importantly, gadgets and stuff to buy. But what scared the ruling elite at Occupy is these kids were actually asking, why does 1% rule 99% in a country that claims to be a democracy? These kids were asking, why do 25% of the children go to bed hungry in the richest country the world has ever seen? They were ask these kids were asking, what the hell is the school to prison pipeline and why is it targeting black and brown kids to actually commodify their incarceration? They were asking, what the hell is the Federal Reserve and why does a private banking consortium control the money supply in the United States? You see, Occupy was asking what the great poetess Audre Lorde calls unsanctioned conversation and questions. We're not supposed to ask those questions. And that terrified the ruling elite. And if I ever had only just like 30, 60 seconds to talk to a member of the real ruling elite, the genuine billionaire class, and I only had a short moment, I thought about this. You know what I would say to that person who's so terrified and so angry? I would think if I could only get a short second, I'd say, don't be scared. I would actually say, don't be scared, because I know that right now that you are so addicted to power and wealth accumulation that all you can see is your next acquisition of power and wealth accumulation. Sort of like a crack cocaine addict. All they can see is just and think about is their next hit. Like their next thing that the billionaire class can think of is their next hit of power and wealth accumulation. I would say don't be scared. We're actually a peaceful and loving people. And I know that right now you're so tied up in your construct that you're angry and you're scared, but I promise you that 
If not you, your children or grandchildren are actually going to be grateful that me and millions of others finally got our act together and staged a peaceful revolution to deal with your addicted ass. <laughs> that's actually what I would tell them because that's actually what we need to start thinking about. We should not vilify them as human beings. They're still human beings. But we should recognize that the system that they are in, the system that they help to create and perpetuate, is ultimately unfair, illegitimate, exploitive, and oppression. And that is actually what we have to dismantle and create peaceful, loving, just things. It's just that easy and just that hard to do. So actually, we the people in this framework have a hell of a lot more power than we think that we do. We actually have the power to create government. Now I'm going to continue with this basic framework. We the people create government. Government is dependent upon we the people. Because in the constitutional framework, we the people ultimately uh, have rights. Government does not have rights. Government only has duties. I'm going to stop for a moment to really underscore this. As a lawyer, it's really important. You see, if you have the right to do something, it means you can do it. And you don't need anybody's permission. See, if Gabe has the right to do something, it can do it. He doesn't need my permission. He doesn't need your permission. He doesn't need the City Council of Tacoma's permission. He doesn't need the Washington State Legislature's permission. He doesn't need anybody's permission. That's what it means to have a right to do something. You can do it. And get this, not only does he not need government's advance permission, but if Gabe is exercising his constitutional rights as a human being and government, local, state, or federal law tries to interfere with his ability to exercise his rights, government's wrong, not him. He ought to be able to go to court and argue that this law is an illegitimate exercise of the police or the political power. It is illegitimate. Our rights are sacred and sacrosanct. Government doesn't have rights. Government only has duties. And where do those duties come from? Well, remember, all power resides with the people. The idea that the people have the power is a fundamental core concept of the American Revolution and the women's suffrage movement and the trade union movement and the civil rights movement and the Black Panther Party and every other people's movement that you can think of is rested upon the idea that people actually have the power uh, to create the society that we want to live in. Which leads me to this quick pop quiz question. What is the population more or less of Tacoma, Washington? Just how many people, more or less? Say it again, sir. 400,000. So uh, I will celebrate that 400,000 residents of Tacoma hold all the political power. It's a true statement. It's a principled statement. But I'll tell you this. I would hate to go to a meeting of 400,000 people in Tacoma to decide where should stop signs go. Because you also have to say, and how many libraries should we have? And where should the schools go? And what about, what about hospitals and health care? Right? Can you imagine like all of the decisions of society cannot be made by any political jurisdiction bringing everybody together and asking every question. I mean, I like political meetings. I would not go to that one. Can you imagine the chaos, right? So in other words, we the people do hold all the power, but in our system of government, we the people delegate a certain amount of our power to government. Do we delegate all our power to government? No, we only give government enough power to discharge the duties that we the people have told them to do. And how does government discharge those duties? They write public policy and law. Right? Now, there is going to be debate over what public policy should be. Perhaps you've noticed that. And I want to tell you something. There should be really vigorous debate about public policy. But I think we're losing something in this country when we are forgetting how to be agreeable in our disagreement. We are forgetting the importance of actually being able to engage in really meaningful debate and dialogue and still be actually civil and kind to one another. And, you know, look, I hope you can tell I actually, I, I don't just have political opinions, y'all. I have convictions, right? I have deeply held convictions about how public policy should interact. But I promise you this, when I meet somebody with whom I disagree, I work very hard to stay civil, to stay, to, to stay just, just friendly with them, because I think that that's really important. And I also want to point out that whether I agree or disagree with any public law, that the one thing that no public law can ever do is to violate anybody's private rights. Right? We when we use Gabe as the example, remember we talked about this. Gabe's 
Human rights are his, they're private, and the government is not contingent upon it. And now that we've taken this time to sort of lay out this framework about the Constitution, I will now tell you in one minute, in one sentence, how the U.S. Constitution is supposed to operate. Now, it's a run-on sentence, but it's still one sentence. Watch this. In the United States Constitution, we the people are free and sovereign because we hold all the political power. But we wisely delegate a certain amount of our power to government. We will charge government with the duty to write public policy and public law, but the one thing that no public law can ever do is to violate the private rights of the people who live under our Constitution. Ta-da! Right? Isn't that great? I look at that and I think, this is a fantastic framework. This is brilliant. This is beautiful. We should try that in this country. This would totally work. And I'm not joking. I do think this is brilliant. I do think this is beautiful. And I'm also not joking that we've never tried it. Because before I go one second further waxing poetic about the U.S. Constitution, I have to ask for a time out. Somebody tell me what year the U.S. Constitution becomes the supreme law of the land. Anybody know the ratification year of the Constitution? It's 1787 is the Constitutional Convention. Two years later, it's ratified. The reason I want 1789 on the board specifically is that is when the United States of America is actually created and the U.S. Constitution becomes the supreme law of the land. And here is a pop quiz. We remember that legal personhood means the ability to assert rights under law. In 1789, who was a legal person? What were their characteristics of a legal person? Male. Male. White. 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 Landowner. Property. Here is something to consider. The problem isn't in the concept that we've been taught about. The problem is in reality. The reality is the United States Constitution was a property rights document, not a human rights document. The reality is that the Constitution was used to justify the effort to exterminate in a genocidal policy the human beings who already lived here. And this Constitution didn't protect them. It was actually used to justify it. This Constitution didn't protect the enslaved Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun and forced to build this country with slave labor. This document allowed it. It codified it. This document didn't protect women. Women weren't considered people. Women were property. They were the ownership property of the men in their lives. I could go on. Oh, and by the way, I just really want to anchor something. White men, most of the white men were not legal persons either. Most of the white men were indentured servants, were actually at best second class citizens. And if you really want to see something inspirational, go and read the story of Bacon's Rebellion and read the story of white people and black people and brown people actually getting together and realizing this small 1% ruling elite are killing us. They're exploiting us. We have to work together in solidarity and they damn near won and the ruling elite realized we can't let that happen again so let's create whiteness let's create this construct an illusion and we'll benefit the working class white people to give them privileges that the enslaved Africans don't get so make no mistake they got privileges white skin privilege exists but they were never elevated to the ruling elite. They were still nothing more than the hoi polloi. They were looked upon with disgust and disdain. And anybody who's a worker in this country knows the look of the ruling class when we're working and actually providing the food and the material and doing every damn thing that keeps this country operating and the disdain that the billionaire class have for us, right? The fact that we have white skin does not put us in solidarity with us. It confuses us. It confuses us into thinking that somehow that white skin actually means anything to the ruling class. That's why at the end of the day, if we want to create this peaceful, just, democratic, sustainable future, we've got to confront patriarchy and white supremacy and capitalism as an economic institution. And I know that seems big, but here's my suggestion to you. When you actually cut the Gordian knot about how like exploitation and oppression actually works, and you're willing to have an honest conversation about it, everything else starts to make sense. So as hard as it is, the narrative around what it actually is going to take to win a peaceful, just revolution in this country, actually we've got to confront race and class and gender 
we've got to actually do it. And when we do, and we, we do it with a, without defensiveness, and we actually do it in an honest way, we actually start to create solidarity. And as workers, what we know through history is real solidarity is when you recognize your, the, the, the commonality that you have and that it's in my interest to work with you, your interest to work with me, an injury to one is an injury to all. That beautiful sentiment is not just words. It's a recognition about our commonality. So I want to come back to this and say, now that I've put this all up on the board, we should ask ourselves, well, where should the corporation go? After all, the corporation is the most dominant institution in America today. So before I write it on the board, I want to ask this question. For real, anybody know what it takes to form a corporation in Washington State? Answer, a couple of people, $200. And literally, as long as you fill out the paperwork correct, you submit it to the Secretary of State, a clerk making minimum wage will rubber stamp your paper and issue you what? A charter. Remember we talked about charters? That's how charters are created today. Now I want to take you back to 1789 and tell you what it once took to form a corporation in the United States of America. First, your application did not go to a trivial clerk. Your application actually went to the State House of Representatives, where they debated it, discussed it, voted on it. You had to get a majority vote. And that's still not enough, because now it goes to the State Senate, where they discuss it, debate it, vote on it. You got to get another majority vote. But that's still not enough, because after a majority vote in the State House, a majority vote in the State Senate, it goes to the governor who has to be willing to sign it. Does that sound anything like a corporate charter today? Of course not. What did I just describe? Majority vote of the State House, majority vote of the State Senate. The governor signs it. Friends, that's called legislation. That's a law. What I'm telling you is the political operation of the corporate charter in this country for over 150 years was the political equivalent of passing a law because the founder's original intent, anybody ever heard that phrase? Anybody ever been in an argument with somebody who seems to be so wrapped up in the founder's original intent? Because if you haven't, come to my house uh, during November for the harvest holiday season and listen to some of the arguments that my uncles make about the founder's original intent, as if that's the only damn thing that matters, right? All I'm saying is the founder's original intent on the corporate chartering process was that it was very tightly politically controlled. And get this, even if you were granted a corporate charter, it wasn't a right... It's a privilege. Oh, and get this. If you were granted the privilege, it was only good for five, ten years. And at the end of that time period, the corporate charter evaporated. And you had to go through the process all over again if you wanted limited liability. Why? Because you're limiting legal liability. For conservatives, I'd like to remind them, don't we want to hold people responsible? Isn't that part of the, the virtue of the conservative uh, principles that people are responsible for themselves and liable for their actions. Limited liability gives them a legal mechanism to avoid liability. The founders only allowed it in specific circumstances. For example, not only was it limited in time, but if you were granted the privilege of limited liability, all you could do was the specific type of business that you said you would do. And you had to prove that you were serving some public interest in your limited liability corporation. And if you were ever found to be doing something else with your corporation, guess what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. Corporate charters were once routinely revoked for going ultra virus. In Latin, it means beyond the authority of why it had been authorized, because corporations were authorized under the political process. And I'm still not through, y'all. Catch this one. Even if you're operating in that specific time period, even if you're doing the specific type of business that you had been authorized to do, if you ever did anything with your corporate charter that was considered to be against the public interest or the public good, guess what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. Corporate charters were once routinely revoked for merely acting outside the public interest. Which brings me to this pop quiz question. Somebody name a single one of the Fortune 500 corporations that could even operate today under the political reality and restrictions that the founders put on them. I'll wait. None! We know it! Now, I want to be clear. There are hundreds of thousands, probably millions of corporations that could continue to operate because as a tool, most corporations are just mechanisms to do commerce and business. That's not the issue. The huge transnational corporations, however, are like the Frankenstein monster. Because remember that in the Frankenstein monster story, Frankenstein was Dr. Frankenstein. He created the monster. 
The problem is that the monster turned on the creator. Can I suggest that in today's society, these corporations that we have created through the political process have turned on us, and it's devouring our politics, it's devouring our society, it's devouring our planet. We got to interrupt it. Now, now that we know that it takes an operation of state government to create the corporate charter, we understand that the corporate charter describes what a corporation can do. We understand that the corporate charter duties are described in the corporate charter and that a corporate charter should only be allowed to exist if it serves the public interest. Isn't it obvious that a corporation should go here? And now, my friends, I thank you for your patience because we're coming to the punchline. When the U.S. Supreme Court comes waltzing in, in an act of supreme judicial activism, by the way, Right? Conservatives are so concerned about judicial activism. It's totally judicial activism for the court to say, notwithstanding prior law, prior court decisions, the history, the founders' original intent, notwithstanding common damn sense, five of us are going to tell 300 million of you Americans from now on, you no longer treat the corporation as if it's created under the political process of government with duties that are beholden to the public. Oh no, you now must treat a corporation as if it's a person with rights. And my friends, that perverts the whole thing. See, corporate personhood is a shorthand for the illegitimate, totally made up, Court created an idea that a corporation must be treated as if it's a person with constitutional rights. And if that is true, it means corporate lawyers can go into court and overturn any law that we pass. Environmental protection laws, worker safety laws, public health laws, campaign finance laws, any law you can imagine can be overturned. So Move to Amend is here to tell you that we are part of a movement that's growing in this country, getting larger, stronger, better organized every day that has core demands. Number one, the first core demand is to abolish the illegitimate court-created idea that a corporation is a person with constitutional rights. Sometimes I call this the well-duh demand because it's obvious a corporation is just an artificial entity created under the law. It's neither good nor bad. It has no inherent rights. It has privileges under law. When the court turns a corporation into a person with rights, it allows corporate lawyers the ability to overturn the laws that we struggle for. The second concept is to abolish the equally odious also court created idea that money equals political speech. Money is not political speech, it's property. And with that property, you can buy microphones and advertisement and speakers that drown out all the rest of us. This is something very important. As a, as a lawyer, the concept of campaign finance laws is a political question that should be determined, well, how is it that our laws should actually protect the integrity of our elections. And some people might say, I want full disclosure. Others say, that's not enough. We want full publicly financed elections. Others might say, well, I just want to make sure that if you're giving money in an election, you can actually vote in that election. So you can't give money into outside. See, all of those things are very different, right? But here's the point. Every one of them is a rational approach to take. Now, you might favor one of those. You might have your own idea. The point is, those are political debates that we, the people, should be having through the political process, and there should be elections around it. When the court turns campaign finance law from an appropriate political question into an illegitimate constitutional law question, they've just turned we, the people, from active participants to mere spectators. So Move to Amend has two core principles that we are organizing around. So for people on Free Speech TV, thank you for watching. I hope you'll go to the website www.movetoamend.org. For those of you in Washington State and WAMEND, they have actually added a couple of key concepts that I think are really important because Initiative 735 will also require full and complete disclosure of all contributions uh, in elections by law. A very powerful mechanism to be able to hold people accountable. And the fourth principle that is written in is the, the concept, without a doubt, that campaign finance laws are political questions and that local 
county and state governments have the authority and the responsibility to write campaign finance laws. Now, I want to stop and say those provisions are at the heart of WAMEND. These two provisions are at the heart of Move to Mend. Is this a conversation that only liberals and progressives can hear and appreciate? Well, friends, I have actually given this presentation at pool halls and, and, and union halls and, and Occupy encampments and Unitarian congregations, and I get laughter and I get applause. But you know what? I've given this basic presentation at Tea Party groups, and I got laughter and I got applause. Now, the laughter and applause comes at totally different places. <laughs> but it can come. What I'm telling you is that we have figured out a way at Move to Mend and the WAMEND campaign to actually say we may have disagreements on policy issues, the principle of self-government, and the concept of corporate constitutional rights and money in elections is something that there is agreement in. And these are not just like talking points, but actual words. Because I want to give you, before we open it up for discussion and question, this last little bit of data. Number one. Move to Men began in 2010, which happened to be the same year that the Citizens United decision came down. We were 12 people in a living room. Today, we're 400,000 people and growing every day. Folks at Free Speech TV, go to www.movetomen.org, make it 400,001. It's not just that, though, that we're organizing, but we have helped 600 communities pass resolutions of support where city council members or county commissioners have voted in support of the Move to Amend campaign. Not just that, 16 states have passed resolutions. And when, not if, but when the WAMEN initiative I-735 passes, Washington will be the 17th state. And get this, not only have we had 600 times where city council members have voted on it, we've been on the ballot 300 times. 300 times have ordinary people got to weigh in on it, right? Move to Mend has been on the ballot 300 times. Guess how many times we've won? 300. We haven't lost yet. And yes, that includes San Francisco and Boston and Madison, you know, the liberal bastions. You know where else Move to Amend won? Salt Lake City, Utah. We won in Devlin, Wisconsin. Why Devlin, Wisconsin? That happens to be the hometown of Republican Tea Party Governor Scott Walker, where they haven't voted for a Democrat for president or Congress in 40 years. Move to Mend was on the ballot in Devlin, Wisconsin. We won there. Move to Mend was on the ballot in the state of Montana. Yeah, that Montana. We were on the ballot statewide in Montana. We won by 74% of the vote. Move to Men is winning everywhere we go. This movement is getting larger, stronger, and better organized. And I hope at the end of the day that you will join me and tens of thousands, if not by now, hundreds of thousands of folks across Washington State in the Initiative 735 because we the people are coming together to take our country back. Peace.